Hey, I believe this is the largest in-house crowd we've had. So I'm glad to see you. Um, And um, I really like seeing these young people here too. We started a new conference. We started a new confirmation class just this morning. Wow, that's something to really shout and celebrate. So thank you for those that are working on it and bless those young people who are going through that experience. It's, it's marvelous. Um, I have a scripture lesson, uh, sermon uh, scripture for this morning. It's from the fourth chapter of John the 23rd to the 24th verse. Jesus has met the woman at the well of Samaria. And uh, this is what he says to her. A time is coming, and now has come, when the true worshiper will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshiper the Father seeks God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. Let's uh, bow for a prayer together. You are a great God. You have been so good to us. You have blessed each of us by coming into our hearts and lives. And for that, we're grateful. And we worship you for that reason. We're reminded that greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. You have given us a victory over death and over sin and over temptation. And for that, we're grateful. Now speak to us in these moments, Lord, just as you spoke to the woman at the well. And remind us that we we can make you glad by being true worshipers. And speak through me that uh, the words that I have to speak will be your words and will encourage and bless uh, these who are here and worshiping with us. So come, Lord Jesus, we wait for you in the name and in the spirit of Christ our Lord. Amen. You know, I mentioned this before that the uh, growth card is something I've never experienced in a worship service before. And I, I really like it because it is a way of accountability. It's, it's a way of checking up each week, and I'm glad we have that in our worship service here at New Hope Church in Brandon, Florida. It's uh, the disciples' to-do list. It, it's, a, it's a way that we can grow in our faith and in our commitment to Christ. These are all things that are designed to help us to be better disciples, better followers of Jesus. Now, we've been talking the last several weeks about, uh, about prayer because that was, that's the first thing that you have promised that you would do. I will endeavor to pray, <clears throat> and now we turn to I will worship frequently. And here is Jesus saying to the woman at the well, but saying it to us too is that the true worshiper will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Now, he's speaking of a true worshiper. But I have to tell you that there, if there is a true worshiper, there is a false worshiper. And I must confess to you that I have often been a false worshiper. <clears throat> I, have, um, I have bowed down to other gods. And uh, I think perhaps you may have too. Um, I have, for instance, worshipped at the uh, the uh, uh, worshipped at the altar of the Gator on Saturday mornings. I used to. I haven't been in years, um, but I used to go up 
to, uh, to this big church that was crowded with great numbers of people who were enthusiastic. Enthusiastic. Enthusio is a Greek word that uh, enthuso, which means in God. So they are enthusiastic. There's a certain godliness in them. And the chief priests of this worship service blew a whistle and went around, and he said two bits, four bits, six bits a dollar, all for the gators, stand up and holler. And I mean, those people stood up, and they hollered. Now, that was before the chop. That's how long ago it's been. But I worshiped there. And uh, I understand, I've never been there, but I understand in Tallahassee, they worship at the altar of the Seminole. And they, they, don't, uh, they don't do that two bits, four bits. They chant. Just like a, a worship service, a hungers chant, and they wave their arms. It's like we were lifting arms. They do that too. And we've got all kinds of other places. I worshiped, I worshiped at the dolphin, uh, altar of the dolphin. I worshiped at the altar of the buccaneers. Uh, and, and I'm pretty fervent about that. But God doesn't say that we shouldn't worship other gods, that we should have no other gods before him. He doesn't want us to not enjoy being a supporter of a football team, as innocuous as that may be, but he doesn't want us to leave him out. The true worshiper includes God in your most of all and first of all. So he says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. The true worshiper includes the Lord in your life, first and foremost. But <clears throat> the true worshiper also has a humble heart. In another, in, an, in another scripture, Jesus tells of two men who went up to the temple to worship. And one of those men stood and worshiped. He was a good man. He was a religious man. He probably was one of the leading people in the church. Listen to him. Listen to this, what we discover about him through what Jesus said. He was a tither. He gave at least 10% of his wealth to the church. That was pretty good. He also fasted twice a week. Now you can tell by my rounded personality that I haven't been doing a whole lot of fasting. But this was a good man. And he was praying in the church. And what was it that he prayed? I thank thee, Lord. He was giving praise to God. He could do that. He was religious. But listen to what he prayed. I thank thee that I'm not as this man. He did what a lot of people are guilty of. They point to other people. And finger pointing and judgmentalism is one of the diseases that keeps you from being a true worshiper. And he pointed to the other man. He said, I think that I'm not as this tax collector. But you could leave that blank in there because we point fingers. I thank you that I'm not as this person. You ever been guilty of that? A lot of us have, haven't we? If we're honest, we're going to admit that. And we must be honest to be a true worshiper. But the other man didn't stand when he was worshiping. He was kneeling. 
He was beating upon his breast. He had a repenting heart. He said, oh God, a fervent prayer. Oh God, forgive me, for I am a sinner. Have you ever done that? Have you ever really done that? Gone to some altar somewhere, made an altar somewhere, and fell upon your knees and fell at the feet of Jesus and said, Oh God, forgive me, for I'm a sinner. Well, the true worshiper, Jesus says, does that because he says, One of those men went away justified. Justified means he went away made right. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out which one went away justified. The worshiper with the humble heart is is justified. The true worshiper has a humble heart. But the true worshiper also has manners. Mind's their manners. My mother used to say to me, like your mother said, mind your manners. And the true worshiper does mind their manners. Two or three generations came along under Captain Kangaroo. And Captain Kangaroo said, mind your manners this way. Remember the magic words. And they are? Yeah, see, you learned those too. So the true worshiper is filled with words like please and thank you. That's what prayer is, saying please. Please, Lord, have mercy on me. Please, Lord, uh, deliver me. Please, Lord, save me. Please, Lord, heal me. Please, Lord, bless my family. But the worshiper is, is, says, uh, thank you. The magic word, thank you. And uh, I was taught that. I was taught that by one of the saints of my life. She said, you know, uh, Riley, when a master feeds his dog, the dog says thank you by wagging his tail. So she said to me, when you sit down and eat, you need to wag your tail. And the way you wag your tail is you say, thank you, Lord, for the food you've given me. That was a good lesson. And I love it. I have, that's worship. That is worship. That's not prayer. Prayer is saying, please. But worship is saying, thank you. There's a difference there. And the true worshiper uses that magic word, thank you. Not just for food, but all the time. And so, the true worshiper has a thankful, grateful heart. And I love it when I go out to eat and I see people, before they have their meal, thanking God. And oftentimes, including the waitress in the prayer. And you know what? I'm seeing more of that than I've ever seen before. It's very encouraging to me because I'm seeing true worshipers who are giving thanks to God, unashamedly giving thanks to God. The true worshiper gives thanks and praise. But then... The true worshiper knows the value of corporate worship. Knows the value of gathering together as a church family under the fatherhood of God revealed to us by Jesus Christ. We we need that. We need to gather with other people that we might encourage one another in our walk with Christ. That's what you do in corporate worship. 
I heard a story about a family that was on a camping trip. And uh, they'd, they'd gone out and spent a couple of nights out in the wilderness together. It was really great. Because they were away from all the noise and the clutter uh, of life. Escape for a while. They got away to where it was really dark at night. You didn't have all the artificial light that you have in the city. And they could look up and see the stars and see the moon. It was such a great thing just to behold the the magnificence of the heavens. They even saw a shooting star. And it was a religious experience for them. And they were sitting by the fire that Saturday night, and the father said, now we got to pack up early in the morning, so we'll be back in time to go to church. And the daughter said, well, Dad, why don't we just have church here? Because it's it's beautiful. I feel the presence of God here. Why do we have to go back and go to church? And the father said, let me show you something. And he took a poker, reached down in the fire, and pulled an ember out over to the side. It was a red, hot, glowing ember. He said, just watch that ember for a while. And ever so slowly, the ember began to lose its glow and its heat and its warmth. And it became nothing more than cold ash. And the father said, now let me show you something else. He moved the, the coal back into the fire. And ever so slowly, it regained its glow. It regained its heat. And it was good again. He said, that's why we go to church. Because we need to keep the glow going. We need to have that warmth that we have from each other. We need the experience of corporate worship. And that's one of the things that concerns me about how this uh, virus has caused us to not be able to have that experience of coming together in corporate worship like we're used to and like we desperately need. The true worshiper needs corporate worship. And I'm concerned that ever so gently... We have been away from the corporate worship and the glow is going out and we're growing cold and distant from the Father. The true worshiper worships corporately and knows the value of corporate worship. On Pentecost, it says the disciples were with one accord. And they waited for the Holy Spirit to come. (laughs) How we need to be in one accord. We're so fractured. We're so separated by all of the issues in the world. By all of the political pushing and shoving and elbowing and finger pointing. We're so divided. How we need to come together in one accord. And we are in one accord when we realize that we're all sinners that stand in need of the means of grace which Jesus alone supplies. We we are united in our spiritual need of something greater than ourselves. That's what we do when we come together in one accord in corporate worship. Celebrating not our differences, but how we are alike in a need for a Savior. The true worshiper 
worships in unity in corporate worship. I am so pleased that we have a church that asks every week for us to be a disciple. And here's the way you do it. You pray, but you will also worship. I will worship frequently. That's what the true worshiper does. And that's what a disciple does. And that's the truth. Amen.